welcome to Fire Engineering Training Minutes. I'm Jason DeFossi with Dale and Zarman. And in this next segment, we're gonna be talking about post-incident. What are we gonna do after we've been involved and have responded to an EV event that has resulted in a thermal runaway and or fire? There's many things to consider and some of the things that we've shared with you over the last few segments should help out a lot. And with that, Dalen, would there be any other additional considerations for first responders to know? This is a very challenging uh, obstacle for the fire service today. Uh, it's one of the biggest gaps that are missing in what we would call the chain of custody. So typically we're very used to handling an emergency. Before we hand that emergency off to the next player in the sequence of responsibility, we dialogue with each other, we execute certain actions to make sure things are safe, and that responsible parties assume that next phase. However, within the world of lithium-ion batteries and electric vehicles, that gap often doesn't exist or is very hard to identify. So let's talk about some realities quickly. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, some of those things provide what we would call consequences. As we intervene with these vehicles, not allowing them to burn, what we can commonly end up with is what we call stranded energy. That means we may have applied water and blankets and low profile suppression tools and all these things have mitigated the fire or suppressed where we have not fully burned out the battery pack. We've also trapped water within the battery enclosure. When our tow and recovery professionals show up on scene and we're ready to hand off the vehicle to them, simply reorienting the vehicle to, uh, to load it onto the truck can result in water shifting inside of the battery enclosure. And if we have energized segments still remaining in there, that water can interact with those wires and bus bars. That can create electrical production or electrical abuse and we have reignitions. We commonly see this in the media, where post-incident, we identify reignition, 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 every time that vehicle is relocated for loading or offloading. Uh, secondary problems can occur not related to the water, but just simply based on energy hazards. So the water may have all drained out of the pack, but the battery enclosure may be compromised to the point the bus bars wiring and contactors on the battery cells are exposed and dragging across the ground. As that vehicle is loaded across the deck of the tow, uh, of the tow vehicle, we can have arcing events that occur then. The last challenge we have is materials. Many times these battery cells will spill out of the vehicle, we'll project them all over the roadway when we're applying water. Uh, so we end up with environmental considerations as well as hazmat material considerations. It's very important that first responders understand their roles and responsibilities uh, and are proactive about contacting proper experts. So environmental contractors and cleanup companies that are properly vetted, trained and capable with the right resources to arrive on scene and help clean up and mitigate these things are very, very critical to the operational plan. We also need to be responsible about our water runoff. When we are flowing water on these vehicles, we want to be diligent about making sure that we're covering storm drains, being cognizant of stream runoffs and other areas where our water flow may be going. That runoff typically has some pH issues and may contain heavy metals depending on how much we flush the battery pack. So practice your due diligence in managing your runoff. An additional resource for firefighters nationally and even internationally is if technical guidance is required and resource allocation or help and assistance is needed. The Energy Security Agency provides a free 24 hour a day service to the first responders. That number is 1-855-ESA-SAFE. Any first responder can contact that number 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and gain access to all the resources and technical guidance they need for both the active incident and the post-incident management of these events. That's great, Dale. And in, and in this, in just summary, we've showed you some techniques. We have shared some resources and solutions to the problems. So moving forward, we really appreciate you watching this episode of Fire Engineering Training Minutes.